book together. A few years ago, uh, I was uh, in Philadelphia for a pastor's retreat, and the, the guy kind of leading that retreat took me and a few of the, the pastors uh, uh, to this restaurant that was pretty much the, the nicest restaurant I'd ever been to in my life. It was ridiculously expensive, the kind of place that I probably would not have gone to if I was paying, you know what I mean? Uh, you feel a little bit bad eating there, but you never forget the meal. It was, it was uh, amazing. I think we were there somewhere around three hours. There was like eight or nine courses or something ridiculous. And each time they would bring out something, I would assume that was the entree and I would dig in only to discover like 10 minutes later when they arrived with another platter that this was just another appetizer. It was amazing. And as you might guess, through the course of the night, we were singing the praises of the wait staff. They became some of our favorite people. We loved seeing them appear from that doorway because we knew they had something wonderful that we were ready to enjoy. But imagine with me, uh, imagine that for the main course, Instead of sending the wait staff out, that the chef himself appeared and, and brought that to our table. If that were to happen, what should be our response? Well, it would be really strange to refuse what the chef brought out or to leave, leave it on the plate, right? That would be crazy, the opposite should be true. If we were that eager uh, to praise the wait staff and ready to receive and enjoy what they would bring, how much more eager should we be to praise the chef and, and gladly enjoy and accept what he brings us? The wait staff's wonderful, but the one who prepares and designs and cooks the meal, that's even better. All the more worthy of our eager attention and appreciation and our acceptance, right? Well, this is kind of the argument that the author is making in our passage with respect to Jesus and the angels. Uh, the passage before us this morning. The angels are kind of like that wait staff. They're doing their job. But Jesus is the chef. And it would be foolish to leave what he delivers on the plate when he brings it to us. Now, we've just begun working through the book of Hebrews. If you were with us last week, we kind of kicked it off looking at the first four verses uh, where we see that Jesus is a better word. We're, what we're going to see throughout this book is that Jesus is better in every way, especially than the old covenant that he now fulfills. And, and last week we saw that he is the full and final revelation of God and his salvation, that uh, he is uh, the heir of all things. He's the creator and sustainer of all things, that the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, the one who completed God's redemption, the one who reigns with the Father in heaven. And for that reason, he is uniquely qualified to reveal to us the, the fullness of God's salvation. He's a better word. That's what we saw last week. Well, in our passage this morning, he's going to continue showing us, arguing for the superiority of Jesus, but now he's going to do it by comparing him not to the prophets, like we saw last week, but to angels. He's going to make this comparison between Jesus and angels, and that's a topic he actually introduced at the end of our passage last week in verse 4, when Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, he became as much superior to angels as the name he's inherited is more excellent than theirs. Well, in verses 5 to 14, he is going to elaborate on that point, uh, on the superiority of Jesus over angels by, by taking us to seven Old Testament texts in order to prove it. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, he's going to apply that to us. What difference does it make for the church that Jesus is better than angels? Why does that matter? That's what he's going to uh, help us understand. And he's going to do this not by tearing angels down, like, just like you don't have to tear down the wait staff to make the chef look good. No, he's going to do it by appealing to the rightful respect that his readers have for angels, and then showing us how 
Well, if you respect them that much, Jesus is even better. That's the way he's going to make his argument, that Jesus is a better messenger and therefore deserving of even greater respect and attention. But why angels? Why in the world does he spend so much time talking about a subject that probably seems strange to a lot of us, right? Uh, We don't, you know, as, as Christians, we believe in angels, but we don't necessarily think about them or talk about them a whole lot. And when we do, it's usually probably shaped more by pop culture or superstition than by Scripture. And, and so what, what makes the author spend so much time uh, on this subject? Well, in the ancient world, it was a little bit different uh, with regard to uh, this respect here. There was a much keener awareness of the supernatural realm. Like, we believe in that, but, but we don't, again, necessarily talk about it or think about it as often. Well, according to Scripture, angels were part of that hidden realm. They, they were quite glorious creatures who played an incredibly important role and continue to play an important role in God's work. You see that through both Old and New Testament. Uh, some of them are continuously worshiping God. That's their job. They are giving him glory in his presence. You think of the throne room scenes in Isaiah 6 or in Revelation 4 and 5. Uh, Sometimes they minister to believers. He sends them whether to uh, protect, as in Exodus 14, or or to guide, uh, Exodus 13, or even to deliver, to rescue. You think of Peter uh, being uh, escorted out of the prison in Acts 5 by an angel. Uh, They will be agents of God's judgment in the end. We learn that in Matthew 13 and and Revelation 19. But their essential function throughout is as God's messengers. They are messengers of God. In fact, that's what the, the Hebrew and Greek words that are translated angel, that's what those words actually mean. They mean messenger. That's their essential role, whether they're announcing the promises of God to Abraham in, in Genesis 18 or, or announcing the incarnation of the Son to Mary and Joseph in the Gospels or taking men like Daniel and Ezekiel and John on a heavenly vision tour, showing them what, what is and what is to come. Uh, whatever it looks like, their essential role is to deliver a message from God. And one of the greatest messages they delivered, they they helped deliver according to Galatians 3 and Acts 7, was Israel's covenant at Sinai. The angels were used by God to deliver Israel's covenant at Sinai. And that's probably why the author zeroes in on angels here. Again, scholars have debated for a long time what in the world has, has got his attention that he spends so much time talking about angels. Some uh, wonder, you know, were, were the first readers being tempted to worship angels like you see in Colossians 2? Were they influenced by early Judaism's infatuation with angelic beings, which you can see in some of the intertestamental literature? Uh, were they tempted to, to view Jesus as merely an angel and not the sun, which might reduce some of the heat of persecution they were feeling? Uh, they debate all of these things, but the most likely reason is the angel's role in delivering the Old Covenant to Moses and Israel. Because one of the major burdens throughout the book of Hebrews is to show how Jesus is better than that Old Covenant. He is the fulfillment of it, and so you can't go back to it. He is better than the prophets who bore witness to it. He's better than uh, the servant Moses who mediated it. He's better than the priests who applied it. And in our passage, better than the messengers who delivered it. Uh, The reference in chapter 2, verse 2, to this message that they delivered is almost certainly talking about this old covenant and its consequences for sin. A covenant that Acts 7.53 says was was delivered by angels. And Galatians 3.19, it was put in place through angels. And so why the focus on angels? It's one more connection to this old covenant that is tempting to derail the the Christians that are being written to, and that is so much inferior to Jesus. 
That's why he seems to go there. So he's not so much correcting their theology of angels or, or correcting their practice. He doesn't build Jesus up by tearing angels down. Rather, he leaves them in their proper place with all of the respect and honor they deserve for doing their role and then shows us how Jesus is even better than that. That's his argument. And because Jesus is a better messenger, his message of salvation is all the more urgent. If we're willing to receive what the waitstaff bring, how could we turn down what the chef himself puts in front of us? And, and so how is, how is Jesus better than the angels? How does he actually make his argument? Well, if you've ever been to one of those restaurants where they, where they put all of the clippings of all of the reviews from magazines and newspapers about their restaurant on the wall, like a Five Guys or something like that, uh, that's you know, kind of what the author does here. He gives us a tour of seven clippings, if you will, from the Old Testament. Seven testimonies to the superiority of the Son over the angels. Uh, he appeals to the Old Covenant to prove Jesus' superiority over it. Uh, and, and the first two of these seven uh, quotations from the Old Testament uh, work together to make a single point, namely that the Son is enthroned as God's Messiah, not the angels. The Son, not the angels. So verse 5 again. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you? Or, or again, I will be to him a father, he will be to me a son. Angels are great. No, no argument there. But, but which angel was ever anointed Messiah? Right? Which angel was ever enthroned as the Son of God? Because that's what both of these Old Testament passages are talking about. God's special relationship to his anointed king. Uh, the first one is from Psalm 2, verse 7. Uh, the second from 2 Samuel 7, 14. God promised to raise up a descendant of David, to put him on his throne forever, that he would have a special relationship with that king as a father to a son, and that he would accomplish his salvation through that king. That was his promise. Angels get to announce that. They don't get to accomplish it. Only the son has that honor, and Jesus is that son. <clears throat> Now, not only does the Son enjoy uh, a unique royal identity as a Messiah, the second point he makes is that this Messiah is actually worthy of the angels' worship. The angels worship the Son. Verse 6 again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And here he's quoting from Deuteronomy 32 verse 43, the Song of Moses. And what's interesting about that passage and about several of the, of the quotations he, he puts in front of us, so many of these are actually about God in the Old Testament, and he's applying them to the Son here in Hebrews. The author has no problem applying what, what the Old Testament says about God to the Son who reigns on the throne. Because, as we saw last week, Jesus is God, right? Fully God, fully human at the same time. That's that mystery of the Trinity that we briefly talked about last week. And so as Deuteronomy 32, uh, it promises a day when God's going to vindicate his people and the angels will worship him because of it. Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, all gods. For he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. That's the promise, right? And according to Hebrews, when, when God sent his son into the world and bringing his firstborn son into the world, God was acting for the vindication of his people. He was keeping his promise and the angels recognized it and responded in praise. Remember what happened when Jesus was born in Luke 2. The angels tore open heaven and gave praise to God and to the Son. The angels worshipped him. Number three, 
This next piece of evidence describes the nature of angels in order to set a contrast uh, between the nature of the Son, namely that angels are created servants. They're created servants. He makes, this is verse 7, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his ministers a flame of fire. Unlike the sun, angels are created servants. And this quotation comes from Psalm 104. And, and that psalm itself is a celebration of God and his creation. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariots. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers or angels of uh, winds, his ministers a flaming of fire. He set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. This beautiful picture of God and his creation. And angels are part of the created order. They're not above it with God doing that work. They're part of the created order. They're servants, which is wonderful, but it's not the same thing as being the creator or the king. The son, in contrast, is both creator and king. And those are the next two points he makes with these Old Testament quotations. Number four, the son reigns in righteousness as the divine king. As the divine king. Verses 8 and 9, the author of Hebrews quotes Psalms again, this time Psalm 45. Of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, what's interesting about Psalm 45, if you go back and read it, is that it's actually a ode to Israel's king. It's a celebration of the king who sits on David's throne. But in that psalm, that king is addressed as God in verse 6, which is really kind of strange and amazing. Uh, and, and when you think about it, and that's, that's the verse that, that the author quotes here, uh, what it does is it gives us a foretaste of a special king who is to come. Already in the Psalms, there's this category for a, a human king who will reign as God. And there's only one person that that can ever be properly applied to, the Son, who is Jesus. He is the Messiah who reigns with righteousness and justice before his Father. But he not only reigns as the righteous king, he also reigns eternally as the unchanging creator. And that's number five, which again is setting him apart and setting him over the angels in their created role. Uh, verse 10, which quotes Psalm 102, I read it during our, our call to worship this morning. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They'll be changed, but you are the same. Your, your years will have no end. So again, the author takes a psalm about God and applies it to the Son. He is God. He is greater than the angels. It, this chapter puts the divinity of Jesus on full display, just like chapter 2 is going to put the humanity of Jesus on full display. He is eternal, unchanging, and therefore incomparably worthy. But there's one more quotation, verse 13, which cites Psalm 110, and that's a psalm we're going to see again and again being quoted in the book of Hebrews. And some have argued that, that Hebrews is a sermon and Psalm 110 is the text being preached. Uh, now, there's a lot of other texts in there too, but he's going to come back to that one a lot. And, and we see it here in verse 13. To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? So, no angel ever heard that from God, right? And, and he, he kind of starts the way he begins with his evidence here. He started with a rhetorical question. Which of the angels ever 
you know, did God ever say this? He ends with a rhetorical question. And the point being the victorious reign of the Son with the Father. That's, that's number six. God, God uses his angels to accomplish so many things. But none of them ever take a seat next to him on the throne when they get done. Only the Son reigns victoriously with the Father. So angels are great, but the Son is greater. And so finally, verse 14, he summarizes his, his argument about the nature, role, and purpose of the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? And angels have their place, just like the wait staff at a restaurant has its place. They're ministering spirits. That's their nature. They have their role, their mission. They're sent by God. They have a purpose. They serve those who are to inherit salvation. They serve us. They're God's messengers sent for our sake. But something greater than angels is here. The Son is a better messenger. And if that's the case, then how should we respond when he shows up with a message to deliver. And that's what the author draws out in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. How should we respond to our better messenger? Listen again at chapter 2. Here's the answer. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according, uh, distributed according to his will." Angels did their job. Their message was reliable. The old covenant that they declared really did reveal God's justice. But even if ancient Israel had thought that that message, that, that, the, uh, that what they were enjoying, the message that the angels delivered that day on, on Mount Sinai was the main entree, even if that's what ancient Israel thought, we know now that that was just an appetizer. That Jesus is the main course. His message of great salvation. The announcement that that old covenant has now been fulfilled in Jesus. Not replaced, but fulfilled in Christ. A message declared by Christ himself, we're told. Attested by eyewitnesses to his death and resurrection. And corroborated by great signs and wonders and, and uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit among the apostles and, and, uh, and, the, and the congregation, he is the full and final revelation of God's salvation. And because Jesus is that better messenger, his message of salvation is all the more urgent. You don't want to leave what he says sitting there on the plate. If you were ready to receive what the, what the waiter brings, how can you not dive in, enjoy, and take to heart what our Savior has to say to us. We must therefore pay much closer attention to what we've heard from him. This better word that God has now spoken by his son that was first declared by our Lord Jesus. We must pay closer attention lest we drift away from it. Lest we drift away from it. That, that, that gets us to what's at stake and why he is so exercise to prove this point about Jesus's superiority. That's the problem he's trying to avoid. This temptation to get distracted by a good thing, angels, but then uh, miss the more important and essential thing, Jesus himself. And, and as we're going to see throughout this book, drifting is a real threat. It's one of the, one of the burdens that the author has is to keep the readers from failing to receive the prize, from not finishing well, from wavering in their confession, from falling away from Christ. 
Now, full disclosure, I believe strongly in the eternal security of the believer. I believe that uh, Scripture teaches that once we are saved, we are always saved. And, and meaningful Christians will debate those kinds of things. But as far as I read Scripture, uh, salvation is a work of God. It's something He's done. And I am not powerful enough to undo that, right? Um, he's going to carry His children through faithfully all the way to the end. I believe that's what Scripture teaches. But it also teaches us not to presume upon God's grace. Not to think that just because I prayed a prayer at one point or, or because I agree with all of the right doctrine, then I can just coast. And it doesn't matter what I do or how I live. Scripture calls us to watch our life and our doctrine. It warns us many times not to fall away, not to forfeit grace, not to let ourselves drift. And, and, and that's... Again, that's the picture, uh, this problem of drifting. Nobody, nobody walks away from Jesus overnight. Right? When, when the author is writing to these, uh, to these early Christians, nobody among that ancient church was going to go to bed one night having believed in Jesus and trusted in his sufficiency and the cross and glorying in who he is and then wake up the next day and say, you know what, I don't think uh, that Jesus has come and uh, I think we need to go back to Judaism. Like, that's not an overnight decision, right? That happens through drift. It's the picture of you know, forgetting to tie up the boat. You know, it might, it might hang near the dock for a while, but after a while, the wind and the current just drifts it slowly further and further out to sea. We take our eyes off of Jesus. We loosen our grip on the gospel. We we allow ourselves to become distracted or disenchanted or disengaged or self-dependent such that you know, over time we've drifted so far out to sea we can no longer see the shore of Christ's sufficiency. We begin to wonder if that shore ever even existed and we think that the law is the only way to row ourselves back home. We cannot afford to neglect such a great salvation, to leave what Christ has for us on the table. Because this is not just a meal. That's my analogy. This is life. This is eternal life and salvation. That's what's at stake. And if the message of the angels that they were so ready to acknowledge, if that proved reliable, that there really were consequences for sin under the old covenant, then how can we escape God's judgment if we ignore the full and final answer to his salvation, if we pass on Jesus, send him back to the kitchen, or just let him get cold on the table? God's given us a better messenger, a better messenger in Jesus. And, and so as we think about that, you know, the, the way he has shown us that Jesus is better than angels, what he's, how he's applied that in terms of being more careful to listen to him. What do we do with that this morning as readers of Hebrews today? Well, I want to encourage us uh, to consider two things in response to what we've read. The first is to take a self-assessment, to honestly think and ask ourselves where am I prone to drift? Where am I prone to drift? If that's what the author is trying to help us avoid, okay, where am I most vulnerable to taking my eyes off of Jesus, to loosening my grip, to being distracted or drawn away by something else? And, and there's no doubt a lot of ways we might answer that question. It's going to probably be a different answer for each person in this room, right? Uh, maybe some of us, maybe I, have an inflated view of something. I look at things like money or grades or success or fame or sex or approval or entertainment, any number of things, and I estimate them more highly than I ought to. I think they're, they're better than they actually are, and, and, and I fill them with so much value that they arrest my attention from Jesus and, and begin to consume my imagination, and eventually they become my hope. 
I tether myself to something other than Christ. Something that will invariably pull me away from him and ultimately disappoint. Because, you know, at, at some point, if I'm putting my hope in money and in Jesus, at some point those competing saviors are going to clash. And only one of them will win in my heart, right? I can't follow my heart and follow my Lord at the same time. There will come a point where those paths diverge and, and I'm going to go one way or the other. And, and so one of the ways that we can drift is by allowing something other than Christ to, to have it, by giving an inflated view of it, to think it's better than it actually is, such that it captures our attention and ultimately disappoints us. That's one way to drift. But there's another way, similar to what we see in our passage, and, and that's where I have an accurate view of something that's good. Angels are good. But I fail to translate that into a superior view of Jesus. It's like I'm, I'm filling up on the appetizers such that I don't think I really need the entree. Angels are good. Coming to church is good. Reading your Bible is good. Maybe I have a great healthy view of the importance of, of attending church and, and reading my Bible, but I've failed to let that high view of a good thing translate into an even higher view of the Savior whom all of those things are actually about. I know what I'm supposed to do, and I do it, but I'm not really engaged with Christ in it. My faith becomes impersonal or routine. Or I, I love studying and teaching about Jesus, but I don't really spend a lot of time with Jesus. You know? and, and that, friends, that is just as dangerous as being drawn away by lesser things to become comfortable with good things that are disconnected from Christ. You can drift with good theology and doing good things for God if you allow those doctrines and those deeds to become detached from the person of Jesus and his supreme worthiness. And so we need to ask ourselves, where am I prone to drift? Where am I prone? Where am, am I drawn away by inflated things? Am I content with secondary things? That's the first question to ask. But understanding my, my proclivities, my temptations, that's, that's a start. But second, we also need to nurture our hearts to cherish what is better. And so our, res our second response to this passage is to look again to Jesus. To look again to Jesus. And just as a warning, that's going to be the application almost every sermon through the book of Hebrews. Because that's the application he continues to pull us to. Look again at Christ. See his beauty, his sufficiency. Trust that he's better. The best way to prevent drift is to pay careful attention to Christ. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift from it. Much closer attention to the salvation he provides, to taste and see that the Lord is is good and then again and again. And remember that the author calls this meal that Christ has provided such a great salvation. It's not a good. It is great. It's the best. There's no other entree coming later that's going to top what Jesus puts on the table before us. He's the best. And, and it is a great salvation. He, he calls it that for good reason. Because the salvation we have in Christ deals fully and completely with everything that's been messed up in this world because of sin. Everything. The sin that, that stains the image of God in us, that ruins uh, our, our relationships, that separates us from our maker, the brokenness and injustice that flow from that sin in this, uh, as a result, the death that comes from it that covers this world like a shroud, the guilt and shame that we bear, the fear 
the sorrow, the loneliness, everything that's wrong with this world as it is, Jesus deals decisively with it in his life, death, and resurrection. There is no person beyond the scope of God's love. There is no sin beyond the reach of his grace. No sorrow that he does not understand or share. And no, nothing sad that will not come untrue in the end when he returns. We have a great salvation in Christ. And we dare not neglect it or leave it on the plate. And, and if that's a new idea to you, uh, this, this whole thing of salvation in Christ, or maybe it's an old idea that you've heard before, you've just never been persuaded, um, I encourage you, take a bite. Try Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't just leave it sitting there to get cold. Maybe, maybe you've come to the church and you've found that... that uh, uh, you found that some of the what you've learned here to be a reliable message. The, you know things like maybe you found help with raising your kids, or or help in your grief, or or how to navigate uh, different challenges, and and those have proved to be reliable. But you've never really considered the spiritual matters. Well, again, if if what you found in those lesser things was helpful, then the message of Christ is even more important than all of that. Whatever it is, I encourage you to, to try Jesus. You're not going to find a better Savior. There's no other entree waiting in the kitchen that will satisfy. And, and that's something that this book is going to prove to us from every conceivable angle, the superiority of Christ. And, and if that's something you're thinking about or something you're curious about, I would absolutely love to visit after the service or get coffee later this week and talk about who Jesus is and this incredible, great salvation that he offers to you. But for those of us who know Christ, who are, who are seeking to walk with him, uh, so much of the Christian life is actually learning to take this great salvation we have and apply it to daily life. And that, too, requires looking again and again to Jesus, uh, learning how to apply his grace to everything we do before you, to keep our eyes on Jesus. Relationship with Christ is not something that, you know, you can start by paying attention to them, and then, you know, once you get the hang of it, you can take the training wheels off and do this on your own. That's not how it works. Walking with Jesus is every day clinging to him, every day looking to him. So when I'm, when I'm weighed down by sadness, it's to look to his presence. Here is one who gets it, who's with me in my suffering. When I'm filled with love and joy and I'm eager to serve him, look to him. He's the model. See how he laid his life down in love for others. When I'm fighting sin and I'm struggling, look to him again to the cross where it is finished and he dealt fully with it and gives us his spirit to put one foot in front of the other. While we enjoy so much of the great salvation he's accomplished already, we're not yet home. And so we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Our sin is forgiven but it's still a thorn in our side. Our future is promised, but sadness and brokenness remain. And so the burden of this book is that we would not neglect what we have in Christ, but keep looking to him. As he puts it in chapter 12, keep our eyes fixed on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have a great salvation in Christ. Amen. Because he is a better messenger, his message of salvation is all the more urgent. Don't let it get cold. Don't neglect it. Don't send it back. Let's trust him and take hold of it 
to pay careful attention and find our satisfaction and our sufficiency in him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Lord, there are no words to adequately express our thanks for the salvation that we have in Christ. And Lord, I pray that where we're tempted to doubt it, where we're distracted, where we're discouraged, Lord, turn our eyes continually to you. Lord, help us taste and see each day that our Lord is good. Keep our eyes on Jesus that we might walk faithfully and joyfully with you because we know there is nothing better. It's in his name we pray.